Welcome to episode 66 of the Liz McMullen Show. I have a wonderful guest on today, Sandra DeHelen. Welcome to the show. Thank you, Liz. I'm excited to be here. So what I learned uh, last week is that you not only write books, but you're a playwright as well. I am. I'm probably better known as a playwright. I've been writing plays for a very long time and uh, having them produced. So what kind of... You know, what kind of plays would you write? Like, this one has the murder mystery feel about it, The Illustrious Client, which is what we're going to be reviewing today. But what kind of genres well, do you get into when you're, when you're writing a play? I started out in the 70s. Mm -hmm. um, I formed a, I co-founded a women's theater company with my friend Kate Caston. Mm -hmm. And she said I had to write the plays because I was the one with all the good ideas. So... <laughs> So I started writing plays, and my first plays were um, musical comedies, mm -hmm. and I didn't, uh, well, let's see, I wrote only musical comedies for a while, and then I started writing different kinds of things. Um, some are drama, some, I don't write musicals anymore, although I did write an opera not too long ago. Do you have a musical background? I don't. I'm a, I'm a composer. The kind of composer I am is called a hummer, which which means that I can hear the music in my head and then I just um, sing it to my the person that I'm working with, and then she transcribes it. it. And um, but I I don't really do that much anymore. Um. Anyway, I've, so I've written. Some drama, some comedy. Um, my last play is my newest play is a um, children's play that I wrote this year. Oh, and and is it something that's being um, performed in your area well, soon, or it isn't because I I just I've been so focused on my on getting my books out and writing books that I sort of put it to the side for now. But I will get back to it eventually because I. I think it'll be a fun play, but it's so hard to get produced anymore. Um, back when I was, when there were such things as the women's movement, women's theater, women's music, all those kinds of things, it was much easier. It's very, um, it's a real uphill slog to try to produce in the outside of the movement, the traditional world. Yeah. So when you were doing um, these plays, were they, did you do satire or... Um, well, the, the most popular one was one that I wrote with Kate, and it's called The Clue in the Old Birdbath, and it's a very affectionate satire or spoof of Nancy Drew. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> and so that one, has, that one did the best of all. Um, it's been performed all over the place and it ran for six months in Chicago 20 years ago at standing room only audiences and that was um it was stage left who produced it there did you ever hear um of the play Uncommon Women and Others oh yeah yeah because um, um yeah now remind me of the playwright because the playwright's Wendy Wasserstein she's a Mount Holyoke graduate Right. And um, it's a play that my uh, that was on. They produced it on, I think, um, PBS, uh -huh. and it had some of the most um, influential actresses. Well, soon to be uh, influential actresses who were in it. And I remember watching. And my dad's like, "Yeah, this is this is what I you know. I think you should go to a women's college or something like that." And I was like, "I'll think about it." And that stuck in my head. And then as an as an adult. I, I watched um, the video again, and I was just like, this is horrifying. <laughs> because every time they get together, you're like, oh, yeah, college was great. Like, the, and, you know, and we're and next time we see each other, we're going to be awesome. We're going to be accomplished. Things are going to be amazing. And I was like, oh, this is so depressing. <laughs> <laughs> really? <laughs> we're going to be great. <laughs> I, you know, there weren't very, back in the, in that time, um, there weren't, women were not writing much comedy, you know, it was, there was a lot of very heavy, 
heavy stuff going on, which is what my reaction to that was to write comedy. I just, you know, I just thought it was needed and fun. And I came from the uh, Mickey Rooney, Judy Garland School of Theater, which is let's put on a play. Uh And so, um, you know, that's kind of how how I got my start and what I did for a good number of years, actually. That's cool. Yeah. So, like, were any of the plays that you worked on, uh, did they have lesbian characters in them or? Oh, yes. Yeah. Not all, but um, yes. And at a certain point, in my life, I decided that everything that I write will have lesbian and gay characters and or gay characters, trans, everything, whatever. But all of them are going to have something because I just was so beaten down by the traditional theater construct that I thought, you know, I'm, I'm going to write only for myself. But as a lesbian, I feel it's really important that I write lesbian material. Mm-hmm. That my books, my stories, my plays have lesbians and, and gay people in it, and um, and bi and trans and all that. So I have a question. You mm-hmm. you you. When I was reading the illustrious cl- uh, client, I I got this feeling of um, well, I mean, obviously it was serious subject matter, but it. It made me feel a little bit like a spoof with, um, uh, you know, uh, what's it called? Sherlock Holmes and Watson. Okay. And I'm sure that the name of the, the character is not accidental. And I was thinking That's of right. Columbo and all that kind of stuff. Is that something that was fascinating to you um, to watch? I was, um, I grew up in a, a household where we were, Pretty poor, but we read. My mom and dad read every night. Mm-hmm. That's what they did. And so I learned to read at four by asking my dad, what's that word, dad? What's that word, dad? <laughs> Until I learned to read. And um, and then I read, over time, I read every book we had in the house, which wasn't that many, but it was a bookcase. And a lot of our books came from the town dump. Uh, my first book was Now We Are Six by A.A. A. Milne, and that it had a lot of pages torn out and somebody crayoned it and so on, but I still have that book. And um, I also read a lot. We had the complete works of Sherlock Holmes, I, I, you know, the complete stories of Sherlock Holmes. And so I read that many times, and I used to pretend that I was Sherlock Holmes. My mom had a pipe collection, and she had a meerschaum, and uh, so I would put that in my mouth and walk around in the house when I was by myself and try to solve the family mysteries and, uh, you know, like who ate the last candy piece and what happened to, I don't know, whatever. (laughs) (laughs) So so I I really wanted to pattern myself after Sherlock Holmes in, in... not in every way, but in the way of noticing detail, mm-hmm. paying attention, really listening to people. And um, so I had a lot of fun with that. I did that a lot. And then when I was when I was 10, I read one of the books uh, that we had was The Well of Loneliness mm-hmm. by Redcliffe Hall. So that was my first introduction to um, the, the homosexual world. Although... I knew after I read that book that one of my mom's friends was like Stephen. I knew that she, because she was, she was butch and I knew that, that that's why she didn't have a husband and children. I just knew that that was the case. So I got in my head that in order to be a lesbian, you had to be what I thought was old, you know, 30, 35, whatever. Mm -hmm. And, um, yeah, you were asking me about Sherlock though. (laughs) So anyway, I started writing when I was eight. I had my first, I won my first writing contest when I was 12. I had my first poem published when I was 14. So I've been writing all my life pretty much. So when, when you created 
is is the illustrious client is that um a sequel or is it the first in a series no it's it's the second in a series the okay. first one is the hounding and i call my stories descended from the sherlock holmes stories because they all will have something to do with the original story the um so the hounding has is descended from the hounding of the baskervilles aha uh-huh. The illustrious client is descended from the adventures of the illustrious client, and the storylines are similar. And in some cases, the, it uses some of the same names of some, some of the characters. Not only Sherlock Holmes, but and Mary Watson, but um, Colonel James Damery. And um, in the Hounding, it's the um, Vandalers and the Baskervilles. So, so that's what I do. So is it thrilling for you to kind of, it's almost as if you're using uh, the same clay, but you're creating a different sculpture. Is it thrilling to be able to kind of draw on something that's been so much a part of your past to create? It, it really is. I really enjoyed a lot. It, I, the, if you haven't read um, Sherlock Holmes, then, then you might think that the language is kind of formal and maybe even stilted in my books mm-hmm. in some cases. But I am patterning the the personalities after the personalities in the original books, and so the language sometimes will seem similar and not uh, like Shirley tends to be pretty formal, and she's also asexual and tall and thin and studious, aloof like Sherlock. Um, and you said that sometimes they seem like a spoof. I, um, I, I, I feel like it's more of an homage. Well, I, I just meant the. Um, but it, it's certain, certainly it, is light. I, I, I just like I think Mary has a pretty good sense of humor. I think it's. I guess it's more tongue in cheek. Where yeah. if yeah. that makes sense. That's right. That's right. Okay. Exactly. Okay, because that I didn't mean to insult you, but that was like my... No, 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 I didn't feel insulted. I just was trying to... Um, See how it was perceived? I, uh, yeah, I mean, I I just wanted to... Um, yeah, I don't mind. I mean, I wouldn't mind if they were perceived as uh, spoofs anyway. That wouldn't bother me in the least. Because they're... I mean, the 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 nature of the language and the and the way that things develop in it has kind of a magical nature to it um uh-huh. and and it does have that tongue in cheek like you know, you know it's almost like you can't quite take certain characters seriously uh-huh. uh before we go a little further on into talking about the illustrious client would you be able to give like a little synopsis of uh the story oh dear uh, i don't no oh, that's hard um well, do you do you, you could read the back copy if you want. I I could. Uh, I think I have a copy right here. Yes, I do. Okay, here we go. Um, book two of the Sherlock Holmes and Dr. Mary Watson series, The Illustrious Client, shows us the private private investigator and her sidekick sharing an office. They didn't in the first book, and introduces their receptionist, Licks. They are hired to influence a young international pop star, Ocean Charles, to pry her away from her older, richer player of a girlfriend. The cast is made up of people with different, with various ethnicities and backgrounds, and of course, the job soon includes solving a murder mystery. Along the way, Mary, that's Dr. Mary Watson, discovers her latent lesbianism. Set in Portland on a super yacht in a hospital VIP room, at Rose Festival and other fun places, and also it's set in present day. Um, so in this book, in the first book, Mary thinks she's like Shirley. She thinks she's asexual. She just hasn't ever had the experience of really being attracted to anybody. Mm-hmm. And um, in the second book, she becomes attracted to someone and discovers that she is actually lesbian mm-hmm. and falls in love. <sighs> Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you know, of course, my listeners like Liz. You're not a romantic. I'm like, oh. 
<laughs> and they fall in love. Ah. <laughs> I know that was fun to write about. Yeah, I yeah, I like that. I like that a lot. One one of the things that I found um, interesting is that that they that Shirley and Mary were hired to kind of convince Ocean away from Zaro. Uh -huh. And um, I was like, who the fuck does that? <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I mean, I understand that they're phenomenally rich. I was like, who is going to listen to this stranger, strangers showing right. up and telling them, you know, Zaro's bad business. It's a bad idea. You shouldn't be with her. <laughs> well, it's because it follows the the original story. In the original story, Colonel James Damery hires Sherlock Holmes to convince this young woman to split up with this this playboy because he's he's bad news you know and dangerous and i th i think that um the hope is that if you have someone who's outside the family and I, and this is true now in modern day sometimes uh children even though they're not children not but you know children of the parents don't want to listen to their parents but maybe they would listen to somebody a, you know, a private detective who says, listen, this guy, he kills the women that he's been with before. In this case, this woman has killed her former girlfriend, her fiancé. What makes you think she's not going to kill you? You know, so that, that that's the hope, is that she will listen. But uh, Of course she doesn't. No, of course not. <laughs> but you don't understand we're in love right no she'd never hurt me this is what people do you know like no you don't you don't understand her she's rich nobody knows her like i do and we're alone together you just can't imagine of course you know how does somebody become a playboy because <laughs> right. they happen to know how to get women into a position where they're like oh some people think that that they're a bad boy, but really, they're gold at heart. That's right. That's right. That's exactly in that Zaro. They're just misunderstood. I, <laughs> I, um, I had fun writing Zaro, too, because um, I had read about this phenomenon in Afghanistan where during the war with the Russians, um, there were many girls who were selected by their parents to pretend to be boys, to act as boys for years until they were of marrying age. And not all of those girls wanted to go back to being a girl. Mm -hmm. So I decided that I would have my villain be one of those girls. Uh -huh. dun, dun, dun. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sorry. I like you know. It's like I'm stuck in the land of melodrama now. I'm like, mm -hmm. dun, dun, dun. <laughs> well, I think you know mysteries do have um, a lot of that melodrama to them, don't you? Yeah, I, I definitely think that um, uh, the the book itself lends really well to you know something Columbo length. You know, just like the the length of. Mm -hmm. um, a television show or even a movie uh -huh. and um because it has that element of like fame and wealth and what what's interesting is when um the playboy is not somebody who's a gold digger trying to you know make money off of you know the unwedding ocean it, you know they're they're both they both have their own money what i thought was interesting uh was the way that uh elijah was manipulating uh, Ocean when uh, Zara was in the hospital. Mm -hmm. Oh, don't you want to be able to provide for her? <laughs> right. Exactly. His house, I can't even, like, I know that there was some hyperbole, but his house was so filthy. Yeah. <laughs> I was just like, how on earth is this person any kind of professional with a house that... <laughs> Have you never seen that? In hoarders, <laughs> yeah, right. Well, I, I have, I have seen it, and it's. Um, uh, but you know, he's also, he's also a recovering addict, so he hasn't really 
changed his lifestyle that much. Um, and I have seen it where, you know, people can come out looking great. And then if you go inside their house or sometimes even their car, you think, ew, <laughs> how, did, how can they look like that when they came out of this? Yeah, no. It's like what what if people's you know how snails they have their their you know their houses they carry around with them. It'd be interesting uh-huh. to see what's inside. Uh-huh. So, the, since I I have not read um, the Sherlock Holmes was was there something the acid attack was that something parallel to something that happened in the book in the book? Um, I don't remember now. I'm sorry. I, I, there, one of the in the original story, I don't remember if there's acid involved, um, but in the original story, Sherlock gets beaten up by some people when when he's investigating, and um, I I really don't. I'm sorry. That's okay. No, that's fine. I was just asking. I, don't I was just wondering where. So, well, I don't know if that's part of the original story or not now. Well, the the throwing of acid just makes me think of all the the um, articles that I've seen online and in, in movies. Um, I mean, not in movies, but in the news, where um, to punish people uh, uh-huh. for not being or doing what they want, you know, as a woman, right. is to take their beauty away from them. Uh-huh. to like either light them on fire or you know throw acid on them and the things like this that are still happening um in different in different parts in the world and even here you know there was a i was watching uh this show um it it rehashes you know how they keep on reverbing all these reality tv shows but they have this thing called who the bleep did i marry and this woman um her her husband decided, I think when she wanted to get a divorce, that he was going to um, throw acid on her and set her on fire. Oh. Yeah. To be, like, as she survived, and the, and the reason why she survived, she said, is because she had to survive for her child, you know. She couldn't, oh. you know, she had to be there for her child. But I was like, what is it in somebody that they can do something so horrifying as like try and kill or disfigure somebody simply because they can't control them i don't know but people do um they it's it's if i can't have you then nobody else is going to want you (sighs) that that happens especially in the present day although there are still the the honor killings and that kind of thing as well yeah, you know, the dowry deaths. Uh-huh. <laughs> of course, I'm thinking, well, it's like Afghanistan and, you know, wi- you know, women's rights. So I have all these things floating in my head. I'm like, oh, that's really cheerful and, and, <laughs> and heartening and, and wonderful. One of, the, one of the sad ironies in the story um, was that she was in, um, she, after Zara was, uh, somebody sprayed her with acid. They put her in a VIP area with um, a beautiful view. Right. But she couldn't see. Right. A little irony. I was like, ugh. Nothing but the best for, right. for you. Uh. So the stalker thing also is interesting. You know, I, I had a hard time. I was like, really? She would think to put, like, acid in... in like I, I would think that the acid would corrode the water gun. No, it doesn't. It doesn't. Um, I did a lot of research about acid, different kinds of acid, and different ways of of delivering it. And um, yeah, it's the, it's the hydrochloric acid is what she uses in it, and um, very interesting because you can read about how to get it, where to get it, how to use it, and then the different types of damage that it does depending on how much is delivered. Uh, there was this um, post, I, I can't remember what, I put it on Yvonne's wall because she was helping me with doing some research. And, you know, 
all the Google searches as authors uh, do could make them a, a person of interest to like the NSA <laughs> or the CIA or uh, oh, yes. yeah, the DEA. Because <laughs> <laughs> we're trying to find out, you know, how does this work? Is this possible? And, uh, and um, Lynn Ames uh, said that she was writing an email to uh, somebody who was in black ops or something along those lines. And she had all these different questions about like, you know, you know, distance for the explosion and what kind of things would happen and whatnot. And she was writing it and writing and writing. And then she's like, I don't think I'm going to write this email. She, <laughs> she erased the email and just told her friend, can you give me a call? <laughs> yeah. Well, you know, it's, it is enough to make you paranoid, but you have to do your research. And, <laughs> well, yeah. You know, a lot of it can be done online. Not everything, but a lot. Um, when I was, there is a, there's a place in, in the book where Mary is in peril. You probably know what I'm talking yeah. about. And um, so I just took a little drive out to the gorge and did personal research mm -hmm. about my spot and, the, you know, all the details. So for those of you listening to the, the, the t Lizzie's tangential romp through the illustrious client, um, you do have uh, a few reading selections that you can do for us so that they can kind of get a, a taste of it themselves. I do, yes. So, I have uh, three short excerpts that I could read from. Okay. So I, I'd love to hear them. And just uh, before each, give a little bit of um, context. Just a little bit? Yeah. Okay. Well, in the first one, this, this happens in, uh, in Chapter 1. And so um, Ocean and Zaro are here in Portland. Zaro has her super yacht here. And they're, they've, they've been out for a walk on the riverfront, on river walk, and gone back to the yacht for a, a lovemaking session. <laughs> <laughs> so Ocean was moaning with desire and ready for more when Zaro suddenly stopped what she was doing and sat up. What is it? Oceana asked. Shh. There was a sound outside the bedroom window. They both heard it this time. Zaro jumped up, threw back the drapes, opened the window, and climbed out. Come back here, you. She was actually chasing someone. Zaro, wait. Let me call the police. See, I'm calling them now. Oceana was dialing 911 on her cell phone when she heard Zaro scream. She climbed out the window, pulling at her robe with one hand, still holding the phone in the other. Khalil, this is um, Zaro's man, who minds the, it's kind of like a valet or a butler or security guard. Khalil came running from somewhere yelling, stop her, stop her. Khalil and Ocean reached Zaro at nearly the same minute. Zaro was screaming and writhing in pain. She couldn't tell them what had happened, but it was clear she'd been attacked. Khalil took the phone from Ocean and spoke with the emergency dispatcher, asking for both police and an ambulance. It looks like acid. So that's the first one. <laughs> <laughs> well, the second one, uh, we hear directly from Mary. Mary is the narrator of the book, and everything except the first chapter is written in the first person. So this is the second one. After breakfast... Remember, this is Mary speaking. I left my new smart car parked on the street, and we took Shirley's Mercedes up to Roger to the back way to OHSU. That's the hospital. Typical June morning, overcast and cool, a bit misty, especially up there in the hills. People were arriving for work as we pulled into the visitor's garage and began circling, looking for a parking space. These were the people who ran the offices, managed the clinics, worked in the pharmacy, Nurses and doctors were on different shifts, 10 or 12 hours, starting at ungodly hours that gave them unrush hours and more stress hormones shooting into the veins. Because I visited Zaro the day before, we knew exactly where to go to find Ocean. When we arrived at the VIP room, there were no carts standing in the halls, no noise from other patients, nothing like a usual hospital experience, so long as we re remained outside her door. Shirley rapped sharply. Within a couple of seconds, Ocean opened the door just a sliver and whispered, She's sleeping. We're here to see you, Miss Charles. 
And then on the third one, this is later in the book when um, Mary is uh, getting ready for a date with her love interest. Mm-hmm. I had a nice long soak in the tub before dinner time. I usually shower because it's quick, efficient, and doesn't use as much water. Today, I wanted to be completely relaxed when Beth arrived. So a full bath with salts, a loofah, and a rinsing shower after, that was the ticket. My hair smelled like shampoo and conditioner I bought for the occasion. Usually I buy something cheap that doesn't test on animals. That day at the health food market, I bought something that smelled so heady, yet light, it could be perfume. I chose a different outfit from last night. I wore cotton gauze pants and black with ties at the ankle and an ultralight ivory tee. I kept my feet bare as I had no intention of leaving the house. My floors and rugs were still clean, even the ceilings were clean. No cobwebs, no neglected corners for this date. After resetting the table with a different tablecloth, napkins, and different dishes, glasses, and silverware, I selected music for the evening and put it on. Then I put the entree and veggies in the oven to reheat, took out the salad and tossed it, and opened a new bottle of red wine to breathe. Five minutes before Beth was due, my phone rang. When I heard Shirley's ring, I was tempted to turn off the phone. I couldn't. Mary? Yes, Shirley? I wanted to say, I hope you enjoy your date tonight. Thanks, Shirley. I'm going to try. Okay, that's all. All right, then. Bye. (laughs) Wait. Mary? About tomorrow. Yes? Tomorrow is Sunday. We don't need to work tomorrow unless it's an emergency. I smiled. I knew what it cost her to think about another person's happiness, even mine. And that's it. I like the brusqueness. (laughs) Yes, Shirley is, um, she doesn't have a lot of social skills. She's pretty much business all the time. Let's get it done. It's interesting, though, that she has, even though she's socially maladjusted in that way, she has a very keen sense of details and behavior. So even if she doesn't know how to interact with people, she leans a lot about what's she going does. on. Yeah. yeah. She, she doesn't, she can't really respond like other people, but she can read people. Mm-hmm. And it's, it's because of that attention, attention to detail. It's not, she's not psychic. It's, you know, it's just that she's learned body language and inflection of voice and in other people. And uh, she has to, Mary has to bring her up short sometimes to make her um, pay attention to the fact that she's running over people, mm-hmm. herself included. <laughs> <laughs> the steamroll. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I'm working on the third book now. Mm-hmm. It's called The Valley of Fear. And I chose that title because it's it's a uh, story in which um, Moriarty is introduced in the Sherlock Holmes canon. Mm-hmm. And we're going to meet my Moriarty. Shirley Combs Moriarty. <laughs> <laughs> I love the name. Like I, I, you know, the name choices actually in my book originally I had the two cops, um, you know, Keystone cops. Uh-huh. So I had created my cop names as Eva Stonegate and Paul Key. <laughs> but, but Key, you know, spelt in the European way, Q U A Y, and then I realized the majority of the people reading the book would would think it was Quay and would totally right. miss it. <laughs> they would, unless unless they lived in Kansas City or had been to visit uh, Jamaica or something like that. Oh no, I know. Actually, the first time I was introduced to that word. Um, and other bizarre pronunciations was when I lived in Ireland for the year. Uh-huh. I went to Trinity in Dublin, and um, and I learned Q, even though which means a line, right? But it is not spelt the way that it's said, and there were keys all over the place. 
this. But yeah. in the United States, in the Key West, it's Key E-Y. So anyway, I ended up changing my characters um, along with when my plot changed. But I kept, I kept Stonegate. I really like that as a name. Eva Stonegate. Oh, I <laughs> like this sexy butch cop, Eva Stonegate. <laughs> That's great. Yeah, so. I, I have fun uh, choosing names. Mm-hmm. It's not, you know, whether it's for the play, for a play or for uh, the book. Either one, it's fun. I, I really try to get the right name for when they were born. Mm-hmm. And, um, of course, that they're different from a different culture, then that also plays into it. Mm-hmm. It's fun that way. No, I think that's it's cool. Like, not all authors do it, and that's not a bad or a good thing. But I always find it fascinating when a character's name has been very well chosen. Uh-huh. You know, wh- whether it's, like, serious or tongue-in-cheek or... Um, a wink, wink, nod, nod. Did you know this? <laughs> Did you notice this character's name? Did you see that? Um, for example, uh, in I just finished reading A Witching Hour, which took me 25 million years to read. Because um, apparently, I did a word search because I, I had originally I had the paperback copy from the library, and the print was so small I couldn't cope. And wow. and then I found um, a free version ebook online, but it didn't. It had things, you know, you can fluctuate the size of the print, and I like to go bigger because uh, yeah. I read so much, and so my eyes, I I need to go bigger. It's like whatever. So anyway, so I was reading, and I was like, I have no idea how many words are in this book, and so I did a search on Google, and it was nine hundred thousand words. Oh my word. <laughs> horrible isn't that horrendous and and the thing was because like I I remember when I started reading it because I read it originally when I was a teenager and um so I had picked you know I wanted to read mainstream fiction in the genre that I write which is paranormal horror and so I wanted to find all these different you know particular witch stories because this one has like a dark spirit you know lasher and so I definitely wanted to reread that and I was like you know but money wise I'm a little tight because I've been you know getting together promotional materials uh, for the con you know for Liz McMullen show like keychains and and stress balls and all sorts of other things with the the stuff on it costs a lot of money anyway so I was like I can't afford to buy these ebooks and then I came upon that holy shit this is not like when I do a lesbian fiction review where I can just contact the publisher like hi bold strokes can I have this book I can't I can't go like yo random house can you hook me up with the ebook please right so I actually went out and got a library card um for the area that I live in now because I I You know, because of the Superstorm Sandy, we didn't live here for a good eight months after the storm. And then, you know, things were being rebuilt, whatever. So, yeah, so I started getting things at the library. And I was like, but I have no idea how long this is. And I was reading and I was reading and I was reading and I was reading and I was reading. And I at least put seven hours of reading into it. And it still looked like I barely cracked it open. I was like, what is going on with this book? (laughs) That's hilarious. Then it was, then it was like my mission. I was like, I cannot stop, start something else until I finish this damn book. And I, I at least put 40 hours of reading into it at least. Oh yeah. I, I, and you must be fast reader at that. Cause I, yeah, generally like it's, let's say if, uh, you know, for lesbian fiction books tend to be maybe in the 200 plus page range, usually I can read a book in two days. Uh-huh. So I was like slogging through the desert day after day after day. Okay. And I, it was horrifying. And then I finally finished it and I'm glad I read it all because there were two references to Shakespearean plays um, that will be, you know, one of them was King Lear with the, uh-huh. um, you know, out, out, damn spot, you know, trying to get the blood off her hands. And uh, another one you know, was in the Tempest. And so I was like, oh, well, I never would have thought of those. So like I bookmarked, you know, those plays and I'm going to go look at them and it's awesome. But still, it was just, it was a saga just to read it in and of itself. But, you know, 
You must get to those, you know, get into some kind of project where it's a Goliath, but you just simply cannot stop until it's completed. Well, not so much anymore. I don't know. I, um, I, sometimes I, well, the war and peace was like that. Mm -hmm. It's not that many words, but it's a lot. And I wanted to finish that. Um, but nowadays I don't usually, the the thing that I do is I, I usually read two or three books at a time. Mm -hmm. And so I don't, I, for the first time ever, I borrowed an ebook from the library, mm-hmm. and I thought it was the same as books. I didn't know, pay attention, that it would be like three weeks, and that maybe I could re, re up it. You know, mm-hmm. no, it's fourteen days, and then disappears from your from kin- your, your Kindle. <laughs> so, so I've got I'm I'm halfway through it, and it's going to go away tomorrow. You can't renew it. No, can't renew it. Oh no. You know, they tell you if you buy it, then your notes and bookmarks will be there. I don't make notes on mm-hmm. on uh, ebooks. I just don't. I don't. I don't want to stop in the middle and do that. Whereas if I have a book in my hand, I will write in the margin or I'll put a sticky note in it. Well, yeah. For me, like when I was in college, half of like you should have seen the borders of the books that I was reading. Mm-hmm. Um, with you know bef- when you're younger and you're not quite sure what you should highlight you over highlight right um and but you know what was interesting uh when you're in a class especially seminar classes that you can see your friends you know or you know your classmates you know whether or not they highlighted the same uh mm-hmm. passage as you did and and yeah I learned to write in the margins and now um now they they have the ebooks in college, and that would have been so much more useful for me. But there's this one tricky thing about it is that when you got your textbooks, after you were finished with them, you could sell them back. Of course, it was like a horribly deep discount. You know, you barely got anything back. But um, that's not the case with uh, ebooks. You're <laughs> you're not getting anything back, honey. <laughs> no. no, no, and. You know, if you, and also the book company or, you know, the deliverer, Amazon or Barnes and Noble or Cobus, whoever it is, they own the book, Mm -hmm. even if you buy it, they can at any time decide to just wipe it from your book. Yeah, I I posted, I posted an article about that, um, where because of the way that the terms and conditions work, you're essentially leasing something. Yeah. And rather than you're actually buying it, like if you buy the book, it's yours. Exactly. Um, but the ebook that they could swipe it out and and the focus in that article is Amazon. And it's very easy to target Amazon because they are the monopoly. Right. Um and they just, you know, their new genius thing, well not new, but it's been true for, you know, maybe 5 years or so is that not only do they sell stuff, they have Amazon Marketplace where other people can sell their stuff on, you know, the Amazon website. Uh, but all of the things that we use, modern things that we use from your iPads, your iPods, um, your e-readers, uh, all the different, like if you have smartphones or you use applications, everything is basically, you're getting a, a license to have it on your device, but you're not actually owning that particular thing. I know, because you can't even lend them to anybody no. without handing over your entire Kindle. Or your phone, or whatever it is. Yeah. Like, Whereas if you have the book in your hand, you can do whatever you want to with it. Yeah, there's that, and um, one one aspect which makes uh, which makes sense from a business standpoint is that if you can pass out this e file for you know whatever song, and pass it to however many people that you want, who's going to want to actually buy the file? I know it makes sense, but I still don't care for it. Yeah, no, I yeah. I mean, that's but that's why I made my ebook so much cheaper mm-hmm. than the paperback because, and I know that that's not true for a lot of lesbians. Most of the lesbian books that I see are twice the price of mine, mm-hmm. and I'm not going to raise the price. I don't care. And if you buy uh, one of my paperbacks you can get the ebook for 99 cents so you can have both if you want and 
and it just that's kind of cool did you hear that, everybody? <laughs> Did you hear it? You know, so when you're when you're going out to uh, pick up the stuff, you know, you'll know. Do you sell it off of your website? Is that how you? No, you... that's uh, that. The ninety nine cent thing is only on Amazon, but um, the the ebooks are four ninety nine. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Anywhere anybody wants to get them, but yeah, you know, if somebody actually if they buy my book. And they want the ebook version. Mm-hmm. They could just email me. I send it to them. Cool. That's so neat, everybody. You know, especially <laughs> for us who are like crunched for uh, being able to afford to buy books. And and for those of us, and I think most majority of the people who listen to my show are big readers. Mm-hmm. So it's always a pleasure to find you know a, a, an affordable option for quality literature. And so that's a great little service you have going on there thank you so i i've enjoyed spending time with you and uh, and all of my accidental questions on revealing the beautiful connection between sherlock holmes and uh the series that you have out amongst other things and that you're also a playwright so it's pretty darn cool i'm sure that i hope you know listeners you know that I put out contact information for the authors that I have on the show and so you're more than welcome to visit her website or shoot her an email and um, have a little chat with her as well Um, I really enjoyed having you on the show Sandra thank you so much Liz I really enjoyed it